Hello, and welcome to Discovering True Health, your weekly deep dive into health and wellness. Thank you so much for joining us today. Before we get started with today's show, please hit the subscribe button. It helps us out a lot, and you'll stay up to date on all our upcoming shows. And you can also check out additional information on our website, Instagram, and Facebook. All those links are below. So if you have not been following along with my Epic Time series, America the Fluoridated, where I explore the contentious findings surrounding the fluoridation of the U.S. public water supply and the current landmark lawsuit against the EPA by the Fluor Fluoride Action Network to remove fluoride from our water supply, definitely go check it out. I will post a link below. But just to bring up to speed, so far we've learned about the history and how the fluoridation program started, which included the first real world experiment done on a group of children in the United States in the mid 1940s with the Surgeon General endorsing public water fluoridation years before any studies were ever completed or safety data was available, sparking mass fluoridation in the US and here we are today. We also learned that the fluoride they add to our public water supply is not the natural occurring fluoride, it's a chemical toxic waste byproduct from industries like phosphate fertilizer and the aluminum industries. We also covered a number of studies dating back to the 1930s, linking fluoride to thyroid issues, cancer, endocrine damage, and neurological damage with the Nation National Research Council's 2006 review backing up these concerns. And most recently, we discussed the newly published multi-year studies funded by the NIH showing fluoride exposure reduces IQ in children and is linked to ADHD. But just when you think it couldn't get worse, well, that's what I thought at least, it does. So today we are gonna learn why that is, and you definitely don't wanna miss this one. So my guest joining me today is John Muller, a retired licensed professional engineer who had a 25 year career in public water works engineering and held a state certification for the level A water and waste treatment plan operator license. So thank you so much for joining me today, John, and thank you for being willing to come on and share with us what you have learned. Well, thank you, Christy. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and I'm more than happy to share what I can uh, from my experience. Um, where do we want to, where do you want to start? Well, I'd love to start with kind of hearing more about your certifications and what your job responsibilities were in your career. Like I mentioned, you had a, you're a professional engineer and had this 25 year career in public water work. So what were your certifications as well as your job responsibilities um, in your career that pertained to the fluoridation program? Well, um, I'll start with, you know, I graduated, uh, I, I went back to school late, <laughs> um, and, but I did get my engineering degree. I, I graduated from the Colorado School of Mines with a degree in geophysical engineering uh, because I had been working in mining for uh, about four years and decided, oh, I don't want to dig it anymore. I want to see where it comes from. And, and so I got into geophysics to, for searching for things, but uh, I'd always had a fascination with water and we moved, uh, my wife and I moved to California uh, in uh, the late 80s. And I went to work for the Santa Clara Valley Water District out there. Um, they are the wholesale drinking water supplier for Silicon Valley. They supply drinking water from their three uh, major treatment plants um, to a dozen or so of the municip municipalities in Santa Clara County and commonly known as Silicon Valley. Um, I was with them for 11 years um, and was able to take an early retirement because of my age. Um, and we wanted to move back to closer to uh, Sally's family in Oklahoma. Um, so I took retirement from there, but my experience there, and I'll back up a little bit, was um, I, I spread myself around. I like to broaden my interest, broaden my experience. So rather than climbing the ladder, I spread myself out. And, and for several years, I was with the drinking water treatment plant operations and maintenance, uh, providing engineering, technical and administrative support, um, filing uh, reports to the EPA on, uh, uh, at one time it was called the information collection rule, 
I was overseeing that project that uh, we had to send a lot of information to the EPA about uh, special tests that they had created for drinking water treatment plants to, to regulate uh, harmful uh, contaminants in the drinking water. Um, that was a lot of fun. Um, but I also dealt with water rights and some of the maintenance issues because the, the water district was also the flood control uh, management agency for uh, that area. So we had stream water maintenance requirements and all that. Uh, but after moving to Tulsa, I went to work for the, the city of Tulsa um, in, in uh, environmental operations. And um, it was actually in, uh, so I started with them in, uh, uh, it would have been in, in 2002, beginning of 2002. And uh, it, there was a period in the, uh, around uh, 2008, eight, nine, 2009, and so I transferred as a senior engineer into the water supply section of the water and sewer department. And it was there that I had my first experience with water fluoridation. Uh, when we left California, San Jose, uh, they were not uh, fluoridating the waters and it was, you know, just something that we didn't talk about. It was not, you know, there was nothing to, it was a non-issue, you know. We didn't fluoridate the water, so there was no issues there. Um, and then, uh, so with with the city of Tulsa, I learned that. Uh, well, I was tasked with uh, one uh, early on after my transfer with looking at the uh, technical specifications for the purchasing agreement with the fluorosilicic acid supplier. So this is something from the purchasing department that they put out a whole list of requirements for an agreement, they put it out to bid and different suppliers bid on it. And they take the, you know, they provide all the necessary documentation and everything. And the purchasing department makes as an agreement with them to, to provide that, that chemical. Um, and in this case it was fluorosilicic acid and I was, it was all new to me. So I did, had to do a lot of research just up front just to get familiar with the whole process. One of the things I discovered was that uh, every shipment uh, must come with a certificate of analysis that uh, lists uh, the different, uh, what, what the fluorosilicic acid has been tested for, for other contaminants. Uh, arsenic, lead, radium, uh, and, and just a few others. And what determines those, what uh, contaminants they, they analyze for are specified in the technical specifications. And well, uh, I, I saw, so, well, this is, okay, something new. And um, this is what they've been doing. I, mean, I don't see any need to, or cause at this point to change anything but I wanted to learn about it and see if there was anything that I thought maybe uh, need updating. And these certificates of analysis, and I've sent you a copy of, of, of one that we can look at maybe in a minute, but, uh, and I've marked it up, but uh, I saw that they had arsenic, you know, arsenic is one of the contaminants listed uh, from that supplier. It was the Mosaic company in, in Florida. And um, I said, well, that's interesting. Uh, and it ranged anywhere from you know, 20 to 50 parts per million uh, concentration uh, in terms of concentration in, in the fluorosilicic acid that was being delivered in specially lined tanker truckloads, several truckloads a month, because um, Tulsa serves about a half a million a population of about a half a million people. Um, so they each of the two drinking water treatment plants in Tulsa produce, can produce about a hundred million gallons a day. Um, on an, an average day, uh, the population only can maybe consume with industrial uses and everything, maybe 120 million gallons a day was fairly typical on overall average over a whole year because summertime, of course, it's more uh, with watering and, and golf courses and whatnot. But in any case, um, so my first reaction to seeing arsenic as a contaminant on the certificates of analysis was, uh, well, uh, it gets diluted, we know that. Um, so it is below the maximum contaminant level, the enforceable MCL uh, for arsenic, which is 10 parts per billion. So there's um, actually a, what, who, who sets this? Is it the, the EPA sets a enforceable maximum for carcinogens that cause yes. cancer like arsenic? 
because it yes. is actually occurring, but this is actually a contaminant in a chemical waste byproduct that we're putting into our water intentionally, not, not just yes. occurring. Yes, that's correct. And I need to explain one more acronym, the MCLG, because the MCL, the, the MCL, maximum contaminant level, is enforceable. And if a treatment uh, plant is producing water that has contaminants that exceed the MCLs of a number of different number of different chemicals of, of uh, organics, inorganics, volatile organics, synthetic organics, a number of different contaminants that are tested. They do a lot of testing at the laboratories, uh, at the treatment plants to make sure the water is safe um, and meets regulatory requirements. And, but, the, but before the MCL is established by the EPA, they first establish an MCLG, which is a maximum contaminant level goal that by definition, I don't have it completely memorized, but it, it, it makes uh, maximum contaminant level goal is the concentration at which no adverse health effects are expected for any uh, public health, even sub, uh, subgroups. Um, you know, special, you know, kidney patients, diabetics, whatever. Um, so now for arsenic, the, the MCL is then created based on the MCLG, considering what's economically and technologically feasible. What can a treatment plant actually economically and technically eliminate from the water without, you know, going through ex extremely costly, cost, uh, costly you know, processes. Right. So, um, so the MCLG is very is for most contaminants is much lower than the M, than the MCL. What's enforceable, and but uh, for arsenic, the MCLG is zero um, for arsenic because it is a known carcinogen. Right. And so, my first reaction in seeing this was, okay, we're diluting it so it's below the MCL, so we're okay. And that's that's that is the what I call, and I've been calling it for years. The regulatory compliance mindset, yes. in which, as long as we are regulatory compliant and we are not violating violating any of the regulatory contaminant levels (MCLs), we're good. We can send our annual report out to all the consumers and saying we meet this, this, these requirements. Your water is safe to drink because these are the standards that have been established by the federal government. And the state governments must also achieve those same results or create more stringent. They, they're allowed to make more stringent requirements. I think California has done that, have made more stringent requirements on, on a lot of the environmental exposures, <clears throat> more stringent than the federal. So, uh, but that's the mindset is, is, you know, and that's your job, you know, that's the foundation of my job is to make sure that help make sure that everything is running running well and that uh, uh, not as a manager, but from a technical or, or whatever, just do the job, just do right. my job. And are we, are we within the legal bounds? Are we, we are within the legal right. bounds, but then the bottom line is legal does not equal safe. <laughs> so um, anyway, that's- what I, learned, what I learned about arsenic too, it's very similar to fluoride where it's in, the air, it's in um, water supplies and not only naturally occurring, but also from all the pollution, it's in the soil, it's in our food. So we're getting all these trace amounts and it, it accumulates just like fluoride accumulates. So they could say, okay, this is the, the law under this amount, but they don't know how much we're getting from all the sources combined similarly to fluoride, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. So that's so. It wasn't long after that that I realized, you know, this really isn't right. Um, one of the, um, you know, when you get an engine, when you go through all the examinations and, and get an engineering a license to practice engineering, um, one of the uh, tenets of that is is that uh, you hold you hold paramount the public health, safety, and welfare in all of your, your work activities. Um, that is number one, primary. And uh, so that's conflict that's conflicting with a lot of engineering companies that are putting in systems and uh, with my managers 
uh, and uh, you know, I did I did complain. <laughs> to, I suggested that that they uh, you know stop doing this because it's it's going to save money. Um, when I first found out about it, it learned about it in in two thousand nine. The mayor of the city had put out a uh, was soliciting. Uh, ways of saving money. There was a budget crunch at the time, and the mayor asked all employees, uh, you know, solicited suggestions of way to save money. Well, that was, you know, this was all new to me, um, but I did prepare a memorandum, and after studying and looking at all the costs and everything, I said, well, oh, we could save, you know, two, three hundred thousand dollars a year by stopping fluoridation. Yeah, you know, let's here's a good one. Well, the mayor wrote back to my manager and said. No, it's all safe. You know, we've got advice from the, uh, you know, the health agencies that this is recommended, and so we're, we're we've got data, we've got information that says it's a good thing. So that's as far as that went. <laughs> Did you talk to any other agencies or governing powers that be, and what was the response, or did you get a response? Well, yes, I did, and because uh, one of the at co very coincidentally at that in that April. Of, of 2009, uh, my good friend and, and neighbor, uh, Dr. Bill Potter, who is a uh, professor of uh, environmental and biochemistry uh, at uh, the University of Tulsa, uh, about that same time, he said, hey, John, you're in the water supply. You know, why don't you try to get this, the city to stop adding fluoride to the drinking water? Here's, and he directed me to the, to, to the 2006 National Research Council's uh, report on fluoride in drinking water. Um, a 535 page, you know, report that uh, was published in by the NRC in 2006. And I started reading that and I started saying, okay, I'm, not, I'm pretty neutral on this, but this is not looking good. Uh, you know, what does, one of the first resources I went to um, was the American Dental Association's publication of, I think it was 1995 publication called Fluoridation Facts. And it's really, uh, I, I think of it as a, a, a booklet on ap of apologetics. Um, it, there's a number of questions that are the numbered questions listed uh, and answered with with uh, ADA's you know, response. And one of the things was uh, you know economics of it. Well, every every one dollar say every one dollar spent on fluoridation saves thirty eight dollars in dental treatment expenses. And I looked up the reference, S.O. Griffin, Susan Griffin, working for HHS, and I scoured that her study, and I could not find anywhere. I could It was so much smoke and mirrored statistics and jargon and language that was, I, I studied some statistics, I'm not a statistician, but I could not plow through that, that uh, study that was published that was referenced that said every dollar spent saves $38. I even went to references that were cited in Susan Griffin's study, went to them to see where, and it was, it just did make, in short, red flags went up. <laughs> you know, they're, they're drawing conclusions from, um, that do not match what the study is saying. And so that got me pretty skeptical. Um, so that's one of the reasons I pursued this even further. Right. And it's just the passion grows. You just can't, you see, start seeing all these things and you know it's wrong. And I think and, it's interesting that you you mentioned before you kind of realized there was arsenic in, the, in this fluoride chemical, mm -hmm. you were kind of neutral to fluoride. You didn't, you didn't have any, you know, negative thoughts about it. You're just you know, kind of going through doing your job and, you know, re reviewing all the certificates of analysis and, you know, making sure everything was compliant until you realized arsenic and then you started kind of digging into it and that really changed your mind. Yes. And and then um, because of my experience, uh, I, I had started re looking at, well, also Bill Potter also uh, alerted me to the Fluoride Action Network website. And, and Paul Conant, Alan Conant, and all, all those people. I started, you know, subscribe to the newsletter and and you know, started exchanging, uh, you know, information with them. And and it was in uh, it's getting on uh, getting close to three years now. It was in 2020 
that I would, they invited me to uh, be on their advisory council uh, because they felt that my experience with water treatment plant operations um, would be, you know, an asset uh, based of knowledge, you know, some additional experience to, to contribute. And that has been a, a, a wonderful honor, honor to be part of that. Um, but it's also been amazingly educational um, because what comes before them, there's the network of researchers that they have and people out there looking at all this stuff about fluoride um, gave me access to all that information also. Their database, if anybody wants to go to the Fluoride Action Network website, it's I think oh, it's database full of, I mean, they have all these doctors and experts like John and everybody contributing to this and it's, it's incredible. Yeah, it is. And, and being on that advisory committee, you know, we're the first to know of, of new things that come up within minutes of uh, he, trial hearings at the Tosca trial. Um, you know, we've got summaries and, and, you know, we're right there. Of course we're watching, you know, you probably have been, have you tuned into the, to the end of the, the Tosca trial? Uh, yeah, hearing? I covered, I covered the last, uh, the last hearing where they set the trial date. I've been covering it you know, since for, for a couple months now, since uh, just before I started the series. So yeah, it's been very interesting hearing all the sides and really learn. I mean, I didn't know anything really about fluoride. And I, I've been like you quite shocked when you start really looking at the studies and the information. And then your story was kind of another layer to it with this arsenic on top of everything. Well, and I just submitted a comment to the, uh, uh, board of Scientific Counselors at the NTP at, at uh, yesterday's meeting. Yes. yes. And it was about that. It had absolutely nothing to do with what, what their charge was um, in providing their and generating their report, but it uh, it is absolutely relevant to uh, to the whole issue of adding fluoride to drinking water. Another great reason the fluoride has this carcinogen in it on top of it being a neurotoxin yeah. from what we've seen. I want to share, um, put up on screen this, you sent me, let me put it up here. You sent me a certificate of, um, what are they called? Certificate of analysis right. that, that you actually had received. So tell us what we're looking at here. Okay. Uh, this, yeah. This is a typical certificate of analysis. This actual one, this one that I have a copy of was actually given to me, sent to me by a, a local dentist who had requested it from the city. And that's what they sent him. But this is typical, this is 2013. Um, it was, which was uh, after, well, no, I was, uh, well, that was about the time I was in there. Yeah. So um, in any case, um, yeah. Go to go to your, back to the top and show the top because I added the uh, what's in the red box there and I'll just read it. This is a certificate of analysis and delivered with tanker truckload of fluorosilicic acid on 3 8 2013 to the city of Tulsa drinking water treatment plant to one of the plants. Um, and, and I'm gonna I'll back up just a little bit and say that um, the fluorosilicic acid is comes out of the smokestack scrubbers um, at the phosphate mining and uh, manufacturing process. And once it goes into, uh, it, it's, it, it may be diluted to about the 25%, uh, 23 to 25% typically uh, concentration of the fluorosilicic acid itself in the solution. Um, but it, it is loaded directly into specially lined tanker trucks or other vessels. And it's not purified, it's not strained, it gets tested. Um, you can see here, you know, this is an example of, of the test. And, and one of those has to go with, with every shipment. And there, if, if a tanker truckload has, has a mixed lot from two different batches, then there would be two different certificates of analysis for what is being delivered. But here I point out, these are my annotations, um, ours, you know, 52 parts per million and the MCLG is zero. And I'll say it again, you know, knowingly adding a known carcinogen with an MCLG of zero 
to the public drinking water is a an egregious violation of the spirit and intent of the self drink of the uh, Safe Drinking Water Act, uh, the SDWA, which was published in 1974. Now, you, and you may ask, what, how is this allowed to be added to the drinking water? Well, fluoridation in this country started in 1945 in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We know that. First country, first city in the entire world to fluoridate <laughs> their water supply, and the public, school children. <laughs> yeah, and, and the Public Health Service uh, uh, um, endorsed it in 1950. I believe that was the, when they endorsed it. And um, so the, stat, the Safe Drinking Water Act was written and published in 1974. So the, why, how is it legal if they set standards for contaminants, how is it still legal to be able to allow arsenic in there knowingly? Well, Yes. What's after, the, what's after, the, after thirty some years, you know, you've got a program. The uh, legis the the actual verbiage in the statute uh, intentionally was most likely tailored uh, with sufficient ambiguity, I'll say, to allow this type of a loophole to allow water fluoridation to continue. So there is a loophole, even though the MCLG for arsenic is zero, there's some sort of maximal, maximum enforceable level that if you're below that enforceable level, even though the MCLG is zero, you're within the law. Correct. And part and parcel to that allowance is the, uh, you'll see down in the lower left corner, NSF, um, they have guidelines and have prepared one of their um, guidelines is the SPAC, the uh, Special Product Al um, Allow Allowance Concentration, and which allows arsenic to be, and, and this is just, NSF is just an independent, a private independent consortium of um, organizations and corporate interests. Um, so you could kind of say that it's the fox guard in the hen house, <laughs> but, uh, because, <laughs> I, yeah, um, NS, NSF certifications are required by any state or municipality that's mandating fluoridation, uh, or doing it, they'll, they will require NSF certification that it has met NSF, uh, criteria for safety and effectiveness, and it does not exceed certain, Certain level. So it, and as a, the SPAC is a, is a ten percent uh, has to be less than ten percent. Like for arsenic, it would have to be less than um, ten percent in the finished water um, after it's been diluted. Um, and so, as long as it's less than one tenth of the ten parts per billion, um, is my understanding uh, of that. And that may be an, an approximation, of, but I think the, those are the round numbers, if I recall correctly, um, that's, that's allowable. And of course, the CDC and the EPA say, well, you're, you've got NSF certification, you know, you're, you're, everything's fine and dandy. Right. So again, it's, it's NSF is really the fox guarding the hen house because their, their membership, their paid membership is, is corporate interests and, and uh, other scientific agencies. So. What I find interesting, because I just learned this the other day, I was digging into the, after the 2006 NRC report, the EPA did their own analysis on it, which was quite interesting because they only covered dental fluorosis and skeletal fluorosis and ignored everything else. But regardless of that, I learned in that report that the MCLGs were, are not set to be maximums of added fluorides. They're set for naturally occurring. As four so, parts of the fluoride, yeah, four parts per million. Yeah, for the natural occurring, but there's no maximum for technical, I mean, people, I guess people perceive it as for any fluoride, but it's really only for naturally occurring, not for whatever's added by law. Like that's the the specific ver ver verbiage that they state in the report. So I'm, I'm wondering if it's similar for arsenic, 
they have these, it's kind of this unspoken thing. Maybe the MCLG, this in maximum enforceable is for natural arsenic, not added arsenic that we're intentionally adding. I'm just, I'm, I'm Well, curious. It, it's actually, the MCLG is, takes into consideration all possible uh, exposure uh, pathways. Got it. So, and other, and sources. Okay. Um, so, um, so it's intentionally added or naturally occurring that it's happening. Well, I think it takes it takes it into account. Right. Um, and lead is the is the only other inorganic um, that that also has an MCLG of zero um, in water. So, um, but then there's an action instead of an MCL, lead has more as a what's called an action level. Um, they test in a number of different uh, selected homes around the uh, community. And if they see a certain, you know, um, percentile of positive uh, lead contamination in a, a homeowners, you know, drinking water, um, and under certain conditions, you know, they're required to take a certain action um, to filter it out, get it out however they can, or take other measures, you know, putting, maybe putting a coating in, in lead, uh, that in the, something in the water that will help coat the, the inside of the pipes. Right. Um, and um, to, to reduce, you know, leaching of lead from, from service lines or whatever, so. Understood. Now let's look at this. You put this statement at the bottom here but from Rebecca Han Hanmer. She's, I think she, she was the director of the EPA of Office of Water in 1983 at the time. Um, um, well, the letter, she was, uh, no, I think she was an assistant. Yeah, right. Uh, assistant, I have it here. Yeah, I send you a copy of the whole, the whole letter um, and I don't have it handy, but um, yeah, that that was a letter that uh, in that she wrote in response to an inquiry from a dentist right. in Massachusetts, and it was deputy, just a deputy assistant administrator. Excuse me, deputy <laughs> assistant administrator. Deputy assistant, yes. So um, yeah, that letter uh, was a, just a one-page response to a dentist in Massachusetts. Uh, who had inquired about um, adding fluorosilicic acid to the drinking water to fluoridate the water. And he was an interested dentist and I don't know um, what his actual letter was, but it's in the, the context is, is in the letter. This, this is just from the last, very last paragraph um, of the letter from um, Ms. Hanmer, yeah, in response. So I've been, I share that freely. Um, it's public information. And, and then there's the other one that I sent you today. Yeah, let me open the other, the other one and we'll take a look at that one. Mm -hmm. All right, so tell us what we're looking at here. Okay, well, the, uh, recall I said the a local dentist sent me that certificate of analysis. Um, I didn't ha uh, didn't have one on hand, but because um, I was in that not in that department anymore. But uh, the dentist requested information from the city um, about the fluorosilicic acid and the supplier, and this is one of the documents that the city supplied to that dentist, and he in turn uh, shared it with me. And this is a mosaic is the was the supplier. Uh, for the fluorosilicic acid, and it says there, um, um, it says, yeah, FSA, division, location, division, mosaic, location, Riverview, that's in Florida, and the product is FSA, right, and that lists, uh, you know, that's their own laboratory analysis, analyses of all the uh, number of different contaminants in the fluorosilicic acid. And you see the the one that uh, strikes that is <laughs> really stands out um, has a lot of numbers on the other side of the the decimal point. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. All the all the other contaminants there 
there's nothing on the left side of the of the decimal point except for iron, aluminum, sodium, and sulfate. Um, <laughs> so that's not great either. <laughs> but um, yeah, the arsenic stands out for sure. Yeah, so we have, uh, these are different dates over here, I guess. And we have 47.5 ppm, 40, 43, 44, 47, 60. 60.1. 60. Yeah. Is that, is that uh, lowest one? Yeah. Now, now uh, Mosaic Company, and it's Mosaic Company in, in Florida, uh, they are one of the largest in the world, phosphate uh, mining and, and fertilizer manufacturing. In 2019, four years ago, they sold a large part of their fluorosilicic acid business to another company called Univar. Right. And Univar has a, um, somebody showed me a, 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 well, if you can go on their website, uh, Univar, and, and look at hydrofluorosilicic acid, which yes. is the same fluorosilicic acid, you can look at their website and it, it shows you, you know, up to for uh, phosphate mining and fertilizer, um, 50 parts per million plus yes. <laughs> or, yes. or can be greater than uh, 50 parts per million. And so this, that's likely from the Mosaic uh, supplier. So yeah, I, I went to their, you had sent me their website and they have right there in their page for HFS. Um, they're one of the largest suppliers of it in the United States with 120 locations. And right below they list, they have um, their standard H HFS. The, they, they list the color, the source, and the arsenic level. And like John just said, it's a range of 10 ppm to 50 plus. So there's not really a cap, cap <laughs> on there their contaminant level, which is interesting. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Well, someone who's very astute, who's looking at a, at a, a proposal for a purchase agreement and seeing that, uh, that Univar has supplied uh, their, uh, a certificate of analysis that shows maybe a hundred parts per million uh, arsenic, um, that would be likely be rejected. Um, by, it should be rejected, but we don't we don't know. And that's another. The fluorosilicic acid is is the the the, the uh, chemical of choice for the large water treatment operations. For the smaller ones, the little you know rural or or uh, smaller community ones, they they don't have the fine the the funding to build and operate all of the equipment uh, necessary. It requires 24 seven uh, surveillance. Um, and even then sometimes there are failures and mechanical equipment failures and cause a lot of people to be sick um, from overfeeds like it ha happened in Sandy, Utah a few years back, uh, a fatality in Hooper Bay, Alaska back in 90, 1992. These are workers that are exposed that are working with the fluorosilic acid. No, these are just consumers who are drinking the the, the water that has been uh, over fluoridated. Um, so you know, the one the, the most famous fatality is is in Hooper Bay, Alaska, um, when uh, it was a community water supply station, and the fluoridation uh, the 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 main pump that filled a cistern, I believe, uh, failed. And but the fluoridation pump did not fail, so the fluoridation pump was filling this tank, uh, this vessel with a uh, regular dose of fluoride, but not the water. <laughs> so the concentration in that storage vessel uh, went ballistic, <laughs> and the story is that the, the 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 fatality, the man who died from it. Um, he became very thirsty from drinking the high, highly fluoridated water. Um, is because his thirst increased, he drank more water. Um, and the dose is how much you take. What do you drink? Well, that's that's and that's what they talk about: this dose versus concentration. They can put we're we're going to put this specific concentration in, but depending on how depends how much water you drink. 
Yes, and and that's another. There's a there's a, a glitch in that also because um, at a drinking water treatment plant, it's dose. You know, um, yes, you know that it's concentration in parts per million or milligrams per liter or nanograms per whatever, um, but it's also called dosing, and it, uh, that's the jargon and the lingo at a treatment. You know, how much are we dosing chlorine? You know, you're dosing chlorine. Um, we're dosing fluoride. We're dosing uh, sodium bicarbonate or uh, caustic soda, um, sodium hydroxide, caustic soda to to balance the pH because the pH of fluorosilicic acid is 1.2, very acidic. So there, there's an additional cost to uh, modify and bring down the pH, um, adjust the pH and uh, sodium hydroxide, caustic, drain <laughs> Um, is what is added also to to bring down the uh, the pH or to to raise the pH. I'm sorry, up to about seven or eight um, pH units. So, where are we going from there? <laughs> yeah, no, no, you're you're firsthand in these these um, waterworks um, facilities, and this stuff comes, like you said, it comes from the plant. And these specially lined trucks and the barrels have these warning labels on them. It's highly dangerous and corrosive at full strength. It's it's very, very dangerous. Um, can you kind of walk us through how that looks from the delivery to how this FSA is stored in the treatment plants and kind of what, what all that entails? Yes, the tanker truck pulls up to outdoors to a station. It may be covered, but, um, and there's a connection to a hose from, a tr from the truck to a, a, a fitting on the outside of the building. Um, and there are a number of these fittings that um, are lined up and each one has its own special chemical uh, that feeds into the chemical storage building where there are bulk storage tanks um, that hold the, the, these chemicals. Um, um, uh, there are a number of different, so there are other different chemicals that are used at a drinking water treatment plant to uh, coagulate the part particulates, uh, flocculation, there's a flocculation process, coagulation, a sedimentation process, and then filtration process of what's left uh, through granular activated carbon. Um, filtration is very common. Um, so uh, then there's chlorine, a disinfectant that's added, um, but some of the chemicals for coagulation and flocculation and sedimentation are added to enhance those processes. So those are other alum is, is an aluminum sulfate that's added to enhance the flocculation and coagulation and sedimentation of, of that, which all ends up going out, dragged out as sludge to a sludge pond or a sludge facility. And then all that has to be disposed of at some point. But uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating process. Um, the, the, but with drinking water, um, there's a lot of chemicals, there are chemicals added. In wastewater treatment, it's all biological. They'll add uh, oxygenation, uh, dissolved oxygen to enhance the uh, biodegradation of the sewage, uh, you know, the wastewater that comes into the plant um, before it's discharged into a river or stream and it has to meet federal regulations uh, testing under the NPDES uh, National Pollutant uh, whatever <laughs> elimination uh, permit, they they need a permit. Um, so they may add chlorine uh, and and then a dechlorination um, to disinfect and then dis get rid of the neutralize the chlorine in it before it goes into a river. Um, but I, it's interesting. I you know I was concerned. I was while I was still learning and still am, but about the process while I was at a, a wastewater treatment plant. I asked the the, uh, super, the operations supervisor if he could uh, request a chemical analysis for uh, for fluoride in the wastewater, and sure enough, it was a little under 0.7 parts per million. I think it was about 0.6. He he did he did that favor for me. He had it requested that it be tested, and sure enough, the, you know there was fluoride still in the in the wastewater, and that goes into the. The, uh, the the river or stream that it's uh, disposed in, and, you know the outfall, um, and then the sludge. I imagine it's in the in the. I'm sure it's in the sludge also that's 
that is collected and, and goes through drying. And then a lot of times it's, it's spread out on the, on the ground as a, as a fertilizer. Um, but um, I th I'm sure the concentration in that uh, fluoride in that is, is very, is, is pretty low. That gets pretty, that, that would get diluted. Hopefully. <laughs> Interesting thing I've learned about fluoride is once it's created from these toxic, toxic chemicals coming out of these industries, you can, it doesn't disappear. It just changes form. So we're like creating more and more of it. And like you just said, now we're throwing out this waste that has 0. 0.6, 0. 0.7 in, in the waste back into the soil and the rivers and whatnot. So that's influencing our food and our just get the more, bodies of water. More fluoride in the environment. Yeah, it's very concerning. So it's, it's, yeah. Finding another way of disposing of it is certainly get a, a, a challenge. Um, now I want to talk more about this letter. I want to, I'm going to see if I can pull it up because it is interesting. Um, this, this mind frame, can you see it there on the screen? Oops. There we go. There we go. So yes, like you said, this was written to Dr. Leslie A. Russell by um, Rebecca Hamner, Deputy Assistant of Administrator for Water for EPA, 1983. And this sentence here, this last sentence, she says, in regards to the use of fluorosilic acid as a source of fluoride or fluoridation, this agency regards such use as an ideal environmental solution to a long-standing problem by recovering the byproduct fluorosilic acid from fertilizer manufacturing, water and air pollution are minimized and water utilities have a low cost source of fluoride available to them. I hope this adequately responds to your concern. So let, I'm trying to wrap my head around this sentence. She's basically saying these uh, manufacturing companies are have this toxic pollutant fluorosilic acid waste product that's coming out of their smokestacks and it's a problem because it's polluting our air and water so ta-da miraculously we have this solution where we're capturing that and putting it in our water supply intentionally to minimize pollution in our air and water is that what we're dealing with here? Is that the mindset? Well, it it still must be because the because the assistant administrator for water that's an EPA position, and the EPA is still allowing it to occur. Yeah, and that is the reason for the lawsuit in San Francisco in federal court under Toxic Substances Control Act. And that is the reason for that. And um, we are all very encouraged um, by what is happening, even though it's taking long, longer time to get through it. I was told recently by someone who's very knowledgeable about it all, that if we were going to lose the case, we would have lost it a long time ago. Right, because this there was a trial back in 2020, a seven day trial, right. and he the judge didn't decide, and there was some suppressed documents that popped up, and and then now we have a new trial set for January 29th, 2024. So, right, but I think it's it's important to, if we see that well, what it says is we're winning the case, and. The emphasis, when I started attending these WEJAC and NEJAC uh, public meetings, um, in my first one was in March of uh, 2020, um, with the CREA first, the inaugural me public meeting of the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, in which uh, Vice President uh, Kamala Harris gave the opening remarks and very inspirational, uh, very inspirational. And uh, I was uh, logged into that meeting and I had a three minute public comment prepared for it. And that was my first, <laughs> and it, that was my first of probably a, more than a dozen since then. 
um, with the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council and the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council, which is headquartered in in um, in the EPA and administered there. So, um, but uh, yeah, I don't know where I'm going with that. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's interesting. And thank you for um, you know being part of this and speaking out, and especially with the knowledge and and background you have. Well, what yeah, what I was gonna going to say is, is the, in my public comments, my emphasis has been to get for the EPA to stop fighting it in the court. You know, the, the, it, it was filed in the federal court as a petition because the petition was denied. EPA denied the petition. Um, the EPA can and could and should, and what I was arguing, should concede in the trial. Yeah. And, be, and be done with it, and because they have not been able, to, they've they have not been able to refute the plaintiff's evidence that's been presented. Uh, they they've had very weak arguments, uh, and all trying to, trying to end the end the trial on technical basis. But they're they're coming around, and the judge is not letting them get away with it. The judge wants to keep it going. He wants to see everything he can. Uh, he's very into it. He's he's very astute and um, very interested in the real science. And he doesn't he doesn't want to he doesn't want to deal with the politics at all. He wants to look at the science and make his determination on the science. And so that's why he's he has waited for this NTP report um, to come out. So will be soon, hopefully. And I think that's that. Like you mentioned, that's an interesting part. It's this battle. It feels like it's this battle between science and politics. Yes, very much so. Very much so. And what I'm also encouraged because um, the public is getting much more informed about all of this. Um, interviews like this that that you're conducting. Thank you so much. Um, it's getting much more, uh, much more public awareness about it. And it's reaching a, a point of critical mass. I think that CDC is well. I'm now. Um, uh, Dr. Wojcik has announced that she's stepping down from head of CDC at, on June thirtieth. Oh, that's news. That's interesting. I just got that today. <laughs> wow! Breaking news, guys. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> so you know, I'm uh, I'm hoping that maybe she'll she'll realize that she got nothing to lose by shutting down the. Community water fluoridation program. That's that's a good point. Her, I wonder her, if she's going to go work for Big Pharma. <laughs> <laughs> the revolving, I, the revolving I, doors. <laughs> I just watched that dope that that movie Dope Sick about the the opioid and and oh, I, yeah. it's quite insane. But um, so tell me some of your I'd love to hear some of your main points as to why the water fluoridation program especially I mean we've talked about quite a few but kind of distill it down um, after you what you've learned about arsenic and everything you've learned since what are some main points on why we need yeah, to yeah it was the arsenic seeing that really was a cattle it was the trigger that got me on it and since that time I've learned so much more especially having now being you know, serving on the advisory council with the Floyd Action Network and getting, you know, good and inform reliable information, uh, being among the first to know about these things and, and the depth uh, of, of knowledge that and, and expertise that that uh, the Floyd Action Network that FAN has access, direct access to and support from uh, the expertise is, is just amazing. Um, and so I've, I've learned, you know, it just, the, the passion just keeps growing, really. Um, that, uh, but I'm not, I've been very optimistic, you know, in the face of a lot of discouragement at times. Um, and a long, just, long fight. It is a long fight. And it's, and it's been going on for, uh, you know, for me, <laughs> 14 years. Right. And, and there, um, you know, one of the, uh, another agency that, that I did speak with was uh, um, with the, the uh, executive director of the Tulsa Health Department, and uh, Dr. Bruce Dart, and he uh, he had a meeting with uh, he called me and my friend Bill Potter, the pro chemistry professor, um, into a meeting, and the three of us met uh, once, and then 
the th we met again when he, uh, Dr. Dart pulled, uh, had uh, the oral health director at the state capitol in Oklahoma City, uh, had her and an associate of hers drive up from uh, Oklahoma City to attend this meeting along with a uh, pediatric dentist. And we gave them an earful. <laughs> Uh, I guess there were seven of us in that meeting called by uh, Director uh, Dart. And uh, we gave him, an, we, we, the dentist, the pediatric dentist, she was just dumbfounded by what we had to say about fluoride and, fluor, uh, and water fluoridation. She just had no clue of what was being added to the water and, and where it came from. Um, and what came out of the, a more recent conversation with Dr. Dart uh, to me directly, because uh, I did meet with him again, just the two of us, was he said, if we're going to replace, if we're going to end fluoridation, we have to replace it with something, something else. Well, makes all the sense in the world um, because the dental industry, they've got the technology to go into communities and do special targeted oral health care, education and training. And, and work with a parent, you know, diet, ex diet and, and personal hygiene. That's what's going to stop childhood tooth decay. We're uh, much further along with our science and understanding the oral microbiome and kind of root causes of tooth decay now. It's not necessarily dump a bunch of fluoride po poison in our bodies to yeah, yeah. kill all the bacteria. It's like taking antibiotics every day, really. So that's been another point of that I've been promoting is, you know, do away with fluoridation, but replace it with something that's more, far more effective. It's targeted. Fluoridation, it's going to everybody, whether they need it or not, rich or poor. Um, and well, and then uh, in round numbers, city of Tulsa has a pop service population of about a half million people from their two drinking water treatment plants. About a half, so with round numbers, half a million people, and just say for round numbers again, 100 million gallons per day. Let's say each person on average uh, drinks um, a half a gallon, two liters, a little less than two, two liters of, of water a day. So you got a half of a half. You've got one fourth of 1% of the fluoride that's added to the drinking water that never sees a tooth. One fourth, 99.75% of the fluoride that goes into the drinking water to help prevent tooth decay, hmm. never sees a single tooth. That's a great point. I have not heard about that yet. And 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 we're and these cities are paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for this fluoride to the in or, the, millions, to, or yeah. millions to build the infrastructure to to add it. And this and this money comes from our tax taxpayer money. I'm, I mean, yeah. we're all water bills. We pay our water bills, and that's uh, because that's an enterprise, right? Um, when I suggested to the city, to Tulsa City Council, that they could save money by uh, ending fluoridation, um, the city councilor at the time, G.T. Bynum, he's now the mayor, he's, he's been the mayor for a few years, uh, he wrote back to me and said, well, uh, water is, a, is, an, is, you know, funding for, uh, for that is the water, water utility enterprise. It's the general fund where uh, we really need to save the money. And I said, you could still save money, save the taxpayers, save the, save the, the customers, the, the rate payers, some money by ending it. So it never went anywhere. It, so the, the, the director of the water sewer department, when I was there, he said, hey, it's city ordinance. We're going to keep water, adding, adding fluoride to the drinking water. It's city ordinance. And city ordinance is, it was, enacted back in 1953. Tulsa has been fluoridating since 1953. Um, and uh, they were challenged right away. There was a lawsuit filed right afterwards saying, no, you can't do this. Well, they didn't have a very good case and the city went out and so it's been fluoridated. But there yeah, there, there is, when you look at the history of fluoride, it's it was being battled against since day one. I mean, there has been all these high ranked high highly educated doctors throughout history fighting against it going to congressional hearings um and yeah that's it's interesting to see it it reminds me of the 
of the um of some other pharmaceuticals that that you know have been battled against recently with all these doctors and and losing their licenses and getting you know kind of you know not not being able to you know get public you know get their messages public etc um but that's a great point so not only is it not good for our health that has arsenic in it which is a known carcinogen but it's also we're wasting money because a lot of it doesn't go even to helping yeah. against dental decay, even if that's the point. And even the CDC has acknowledged the pr principal benefit from, from fluoride is topical application, not from ingestion. Yes. And there's numerous studies to back that up um, as well. So yes. Um, now, what do you currently, I'm, I'm assuming you, um, like to avoid drinking anything fluoridated. Uh, what what are your um, kind of what's your strategy as far as filtering fluoride out? Well, um, we moved to uh, where we live now um, in last July to a uh, more of a rural community, and it's on a rural water district uh, supply, and they get it from uh, uh, an aquifer, and they do not add fluoride. Okay. Oh, and we moved here to be closer to my daughter and her husband and our first grandbaby, a okay. uh, girl, beautiful little Sadie Rose. Um, and they live in Edmond, Oklahoma, and Edmond does not fluoridate their drinking water either. And so um, so I feel they're, they're safe, at least from fluoride. Right, especially the baby and the mother. When the baby, you... yes. That's and so her whole pregnancy, she was, you know, in Edmond, unfluoridated water. She's very much aware. And she drinks a lot of water too, yeah. uh, my, my daughter. And um, so it's really important for her to, she pays attention to that. She knows she knows where I stand on that. <laughs> New science is quite scary when it comes to pregnant pregnant mothers and IQ well, and ADHD. It's- uh, Well, and, and the whole country is in a mental health crisis. Yes. And, and we're in a chronic illness crisis. That's the thing. Business the 70s is exponentially increasing and it's expected to exponentially increase. So we're doing something wrong. <laughs> yeah. And we can't, if, of course, it's not all fluoride. Right? No, no. I wouldn't think so. But it's certainly, it's certainly a contributor. Absolutely. It's definitely a contributor. There's, I think that's, we can say that unequivocally. Just yeah. over overload of of toxins from every angle. I mean, it's thing thing too that my next article coming out. Spoiler alert is is about all the sources. Um, fluoride we can find fluoride. It's it's not just in the water. There's, I mean, juices have up to can have up to six um, milligrams per liter. Uh, teas, um, chicken. I mean, we're getting quite like much higher doses of it than we could imagine um, yeah. from many different sources. And, and I have to commend the, the, uh, the authors of the NTP report that yes. we, uh, is such a, in focus these days. Um, they made sure that they put included language in there that it's not just exposure from drinking water yeah. um, that we're looking at when, you, uh, when you're testing a pregnant mom's you know, urine, for example, you know, that could be, it may not all be from just the drinking water. There are other sources. Um, tell us that we've got a Pepsi plant. You know, we've got Bama foods that make Bama pies. And then, you know, any food that's, you know, tell us if fluoridates its water. That water is going into the Pepsi plant. Anything that's made with fluoridated water, water high fluorides in soil. I mean, we're getting, the dose we're getting is much, much higher. So it's like- And hospitals have, and, and like, um, uh, for kidney, uh, you know, treatment, um, you know, they have to purify their water uh, to get the fluoride out because uh, fluoride going through uh, dialysis machines uh, can kill people. Yeah. So those uh, in hospitals and and they have to make sure their water is is really good. The sensitive subpopulations, yeah, that's that's an important point. I think is the you know children you know, pregnant women, these people that are ill with kidney issues. I mean, that's, that's a big reason to think deeper about adding fluoride. Right, yeah. 
people, uh, industries, well, medical, you know, that are dependent on very pure water, they can't just use straight tap water. <laughs> and they have to spend the money to process it to get it out, which is a little counterproductive. Um, do you have any, for those listening that are interested in learning more, do you have any great resources you would recommend um, if people want to learn more about this? Um, or I think, yeah, the Fluoride Action Network, um, fluoridealert.org is the website. Um, there's also, for the lawsuit, um, and you've interviewed uh, Karen and, and Brenda, and yes. they produced a website. Um, a great job. Fluoride lawsuit, and excellent, excellent. I'm, I'm so thankful that they've done that. Yeah, they're yeah. they are on top of it. They keep me updated. Oh, they are, they're committed. They're yeah. great. I appreciate them both so much. Um, before we wrap it up, do you have any final thoughts or words for everybody listening regarding the fluoridation of the United States? Oh, I would just really like to see it re all replaced with more effective and targeted um, oral health, you know, programs that that really address it where it's needed, um, and get you know, be done with it. Be done with it. Put the put the controversy behind us. It's time. It's it's reaching. You know, with the public awareness in, increasing as it is, um, it's it's reaching critical mass um, that it really has to be done away with. And with <laughs> I've suggested that that uh, uh, letter be sent to um, administrator uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Walensky uh, as as she steps down that uh, he's got nothing to lose by doing away with the CWF Community Water Fluoridation Program on her departure on her departure. <laughs> so. We need signatures and and the petition to get to her. <laughs> well, and the EPA, all the EPA just has to back off. They've got you know their attorneys uh, that are representing EPA are from the Department of Justice. Um, in the this is in the Tosca lawsuit, and uh, Administrator Regan Michael Regan, the head of the EPA, he could he could do it. He could tell those attorneys to concede, give it to them. And let's start the rulemaking process. CDC can adapt. HHS can adapt. Everybody's going to have to adapt to it. Um, but if public health really is number one, then there's no other option. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, John, and sharing all this and sharing all this information with everybody. Um, again, I was astounded by the added, the added uh, icing on the cake of arsenic being in fluoride. So thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Best to you. Thank you. Remember, knowledge is power. The more you understand about your body, the better you're able to stay healthy and prevent disease. If you like this video, please like and share with others. This information could really help someone you may know. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button below to be sure you don't miss out on our future shows. And I will see you all next Wednesday on the next episode of Discovering True Health. Thank you.